So there's this one thing with this aircraft that, you know, when you read anything about it, quite a few sources get it wrong. And it's essentially that. Today's guest is part of the last generation of German fighter planes coming out of the First World War. Whilst its boxy design provides a harsh contrast to some other German fighters, like for example the Albatross and the new Falz, it was so much more than its lumbering appearance makes it out to be. Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and this is the Fokker D7. It's a biplane fighter introduced in the German Luftstreitkräfte in 1918 during the First World War, designed by the Dutch Anthony Fokker. The aircraft itself is 6.9 meters in length, spans 8.9 meters on the top wing and stands at 2.8 meters. Now without further delay, let's have a closer look at the one found here at the Flugwerft Schleisheim near Munich in Germany. The plane features a welded tubular steel construction in the fuselage and of course the wings are of a wooden rib and sparse construction. Both are of course covered in fabric as is more or less standard in World War I. The design itself is not the most outlandish considering some other contenders but it was very tough and very strong. The aircraft featured two different engines, either a Mercedes, which we actually have here, or a Bayern. Now both are six cylinder vertical inline engines and the 180 horsepower Mercedes is a direct upgrade from the earlier 160 horsepower D3 version. Overall, however, it's still the same engine. The bore is 140 millimeters and the stroke is 160. However, domed pistons were added and this gave more volume and thus the engine had a better compression ratio, 5.7 uh, to one rather than the earlier 4.6 to one. The carburetor itself also features an automatic altitude compensator. Like the Mercedes engine, the later 185 horsepower BMW 3A is essentially a copy of the earlier 160 horsepower Mercedes previously used, but it features some improvements such as a new carburetor and a larger bore, 150 millimeters and a stroke of 180 millimeters. It has a compression ratio of 6.5 to one which is quite high for the time and it also features better cooling and it weighs less. Compared to the 180 horsepower Mercedes, the pistons are also made of aluminium, although this was nothing new really for the time. The carburetor itself can be fixed on either side of the engine with the same applying of course to the exhaust. It was quite economical as well running on a mixture of 60% benzene and 40% petrol. Now what makes this engine so special beyond, let's say, the technical aspects is that it represented and provided the first true breakthrough in Germany during the war from going away from the Mercedes engines that had really dominated engine procurement for the last couple of years and coming up with a new design. Depending on the engine then, of course, if you had the Mercedes or the BMW, you could achieve a top speed of 190 to 200 kilometers an hour. The radiator is special in the way that it was mounted up front, more or less a radical departure from a more standardized German practice. Now, the radiator is secured to the aircraft um, on either side, and this actually merits some attention because initially, the changes that were made here by Albatross are clever as they changed the bolt and nut arrangement from the Fokker original. In the Fokker aircraft, uh, the nut of the bolt would drop inwards into the engine bay, easily lost in the compartment. And of course, this was a little bit annoying if you're a crew chief or somebody doing maintenance. Albatross changed that so it goes off on the outside. On the port side of the aircraft, there was also a water tank fitted. There is a small spring-loaded shutter on the starboard side. In fact, we have the cable running right here and the shutter right there. And that allows you to close off one third of the radiator. In those aircraft that were actually also produced by Ostdeutsche Albatrosswerke, two shutters were provided, one on either side. This is where we make a short unscheduled excursion. After we finished filming this episode, I wanted to see the engine section in a bit more detail. 
The museum is 99% sure that this aircraft was built in the Netherlands by Fokker in 1919. So that made me wonder. I asked for a ladder, a measuring tape and had a look inside. I suspected that Fokker did incorporate some of the changes also made by Albatross at some point in the production run of the D7. That would make sense. As I mentioned, his initial production run only featured a closing radiator flap on the starboard side of the aircraft. In this aircraft, after having a closer look, I also found one on the left, the port side. It's not easy to see, but there you are, a flap looking similar to the one on the right side. I couldn't get enough light to see whether it could be hinged, nor did I try to move it, because, well, quite frankly, that would be stupid. But it does suggest that the aircraft here might have benefited from similar modifications that Albatross had made in some way. Although it is missing on this example, the aircraft's weaponry should surprise no one really. Standard loadout were two synchronized machine guns and these of course fired your good old 7.92 by 57 mm round. Each gun weighed about 12 kilograms and had a fire rate of about 400 to 500 rounds per minute. While loadouts would vary, generally the aircraft allowed each gun to be uh, supplied with up to uh, 500 rounds. While empty cases were evacuated overboard, the belt itself is recycled or collected rather in a collection box. The gun allows for both lateral and vertical adjustment, although not by much. Unlike with the engine, the workmanship around the weaponry itself on German aircraft was generally slightly cruder. Uh, there are no anti-friction devices and the mountings itself are less rigid than in some of the Allied aircraft. While the interrupter itself features no real improvements from the 1916 and 1917 versions of the earlier types, then again the German interrupters actually worked, so there's that. So let's have a walk around of the Fokker D7 then. Starting up on the way on the front, we have a two-bladed wooden laminated propeller. Behind that immediately, we of course have the radiator. We then have the six uh, cylinder engine in line, the exhaust you can see right there. And then of course, we have the fuel tank that is set just behind that. Now there are two fuel tanks in the Fokker, the biggest one holding about 60 liters. And of course, there's an oil tank as well. Then we come to the wings. Now the wings are special in the Fokker D7 because they are of a cantilever design. And this was one of the first mass-produced aircraft to have this sort of wing, which is why it post-war also became quite interesting for all the various nations that fought during the war to analyze this aircraft a little bit more. Up top on the uh, top wing, we have a, a special modified Göttingen Gö uh, 418 airfoil. And as you can also see, of course, the, the the, uh, the thickness of the wing is quite high. The leading edge goes out slightly rounded on the end. The Fokker has generally had very amicable stalling characteristics and flying characteristics. Uh, we have a balanced aileron on either side, only on the top wing. And as you can also see, of course, the bottom wing and the top wing, they're staggered, dihedral, and uh, the, top, uh, the bottom wing is slightly shorter than the top wing. As we go towards the cockpit, can start seeing the control cables coming out here towards the aileron. We can also of course see the wooden construction there, wooden ribs and spars. And then down here inside there should have been the weaponry which is not uh, installed on this aircraft right now. Two machine guns of course. We have a little bit of a windscreen as well protecting the pilot from those oil splashes coming up from the cylinders. As we move to the side of the aircraft we can see the writing here on the canvas, uh, the Fokker D7, and then we have the construction number. Now there is a way to actually see whether it was Fokker who constructed this aircraft during the war or not. There were licenses given out to Albatross and AEG, although only Albatross actually constructed any more uh, Fokker D7s. In fact, they constructed the majority of the aircraft because Fokker, for all the success he had with you know, German fighter procurement during the war, he never really built a real factory. So he, hadn't, uh, he didn't have the capacity to build a lot of aircraft. So Albatross stepped in with their own uh, factory in Johannesthal. And then of course, we also have the Ostdeutsche Albatross Werke in nowadays Poland, which also built the aircraft. And if the aircraft was built by one of those two, you would have 
an extra writing here, an extra lettering, three letter uh, ALB for Albatross or OA. W for Ostdeutsche Albatrossberger. That is how you could identify this. Of course, we have the Balkan Kreuz as well, identifying it as a German military machine. We have a large triangular uh, tailplane with a nicely rounded, smooth elevator. Uh, a very small uh, vertical stabilizer, but a large semicircular rudder tapering off right into the fuselage. The fuselage itself, of course, is sort of squared and tapers off all the way into the end. Now, as we navigate under the wing of the Cessna here, we can also find these handholds here. These were used by the ground crews in order to move the aircraft uh, in, uh, in the, during the maintenance hours and so on and so forth without actually having to, you know, uh, start the engine. And you could also generally uh, mount the air aircraft slightly higher there if you needed to do maintenance. The camo scheme. Now this is of course the famous um, camo scheme that the Germans used at the end of the war. This is called officially a uh, Buntfarbenaufdruck. And what it is, is essentially a combination of four to five matte earth-like colors that were uh, randomized with these uh, hexagons. Now, most, although this is sort of this iconic paint scheme, most fighter pilots and most fighter squadrons started overpainting it with their own colors to make identification in the sky a little bit easier between the different squadrons and between the different pilots. As we move on, of course, once again, we have a look at the uh, cockpit and we also have these footrests that would provide a little bit of a step in to the cockpit if you wanted to mount up. And as we then move on towards the end of the aircraft. One thing I would also like to mention once again, we don't have any additional struts beyond the ones on the outer wing here and the ones on the inside into the fuselage. There are no sort of extra additional ropes or bracing struts that can be found. And this is of course due to the cantilever wing design. And the last, very much last detail I'm gonna to touch upon is the gear. The gear itself, of course, is very solid construction, a very strong gear section, but one of the changes that Albatross did with the design of the Fokker is they changed just minor little things. In fact, they never really got full plans from Fokker. Again, that's not how the man worked. He sort of gave them an aircraft and they made their plans from that and from you know, some of the more concept art designs that he has provided them as well. But many of the changes they made were essentially to make the aircraft a little bit user-friendly, especially for maintenance. In the Albatross conversions of the aircraft, it's two-piece, which could be taken off very easily, allowing for easier maintenance of the machine. Normal procedure during this series is, of course, to check out the cockpit in the second half of the video, or as part two. As you can see, the museum had installed a glass plate some time ago to help conserve the aircraft, preventing direct access. Thus, I will substitute the cockpit with a digital one, giving you a tour of it in that way. To start out with the cockpit, it serves to mention that while World War I cockpits by 1918 started to standardize, you'll still find some variation between similar machines and their cockpits. You'll also miss a lot of the basic instruments we are used to today. In the Fokker D7, we will start out up front. To the left, you'll see a thermometer. This is mounted on top of the outgoing cooling liquid pipe. We have a sight for each machine gun. During World War I, sometimes an additional primary sight was mounted. Your fuel gauge is also prominently presented between both guns. You'll notice how both weapons have a cage-like front section. This provided cooling and lightened the gun, both from the material weight that was missing and the missing water that usually cooled similar guns on the ground. Up high, the air circulation tends to provide enough cooling. Both guns are supplied by a belt, each fed from the right side. Cases are freely ejected while the belt is recycled to the left of each gun. Each gun can be manually cocked with an easily accessible handle and this also allows the pilot to clear a stoppage or a feeding problem. The ammo counters displayed here were rare. Moving downwards, the tachometer displaying engine RPMs is fitted centrally. To either side, you will find your main and auxiliary fuel tank pressure. You might have noticed that in the museum's 1919 production model, this sits to the left, while the main fuel tank pressure gates is substituted with a liquid cooling thermometer, showing you how the layout actually changed over time. 
To the left, you have your magnetos, a clock and your starter magneto, and your fuel tank selector. A liquid-based quer Neigungsmesser displays your roll angle. On the right, we have an altimeter and behind it an oil pump. Just beneath it, you'll find the air pump selector and a an hand-operated fuel pump sits to your right, with the radiator cooling flap control right next to it. Your control stick features the gun triggers. They could be used at the same time or individually. You'd use your middle and your index finger to operate each gun. If you watch our Inside the Cockpit of the Albatross, you'll also recognize the throttle control on the actual stick. However, an additional throttle control is also set to the left, in the more orthodox position. An oxygen supply for the pilot is given to the left of the seat, with a compass on the opposite side. In German World War I aircraft, speedometers inside the cockpit showing the speed tend to be missing, except for very rare cases and late war aircraft. Instead, out on the wing you'll find an anometer displaying your airspeed. So yeah, that completes our roundup here of the Fokker D7. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's have some concluding thoughts. The Fokker D7 was one of those typical Anthony Fokker designs. Very practical, creative, competitive, <laughs> but never truly finished or polished. That's just how the man worked. Initially, especially his own production run had quite a few problems such as leaking fuel tanks and overheating ammunition boxes, which are obviously somewhat subpar, to the point that incendiary ammo was forbidden to be carried in these aircraft. This was later on fixed, as uh, the engine arrangement was slightly changed and uh, specifically also the plane panels on the side were changed to vented ones. It had quite the impact on the front lines, the, never mind the problems that it might have had early on. With it, Fokker successfully squashed Albatross's dominance in German fighter procurement, uh, reversing really the situation of late 1916. His aircraft duly brought home many victories, with pilots exploiting its exceptional lift and graceful stalling characteristic to the fullest and to good effect as well. When it fell into the hands of the Allies, it did raise quite some eyebrows and attracted praise. Uh, some of the reports from that time are surprising in the way that they are a lot more objective than some of the more, let's say, uh, dismissive reports previously created on German uh, fighters. They're actually quite candid and say, this is a good aircraft. The airfoil itself attracted attention, as did the cantilever wings, which were a novelty, of course. But it was specifically the new BMW engine when it came out that caused quite a lot of concern, since it was the first sign that the Germans were, might be on the verge of overcoming they are lingering engine problems. When Germany, of course, surrendered, around 700 machines were operational. With the German surrender, well, in November 1918, there is one thing uh, everyone or a lot of people seem to get wrong with this aircraft in popular uh, history. Uh, you might have heard how the Allies specifically instructed Germany in the Treaty of Versailles to hand over all examples of the D7. This is not entirely correct. The Treaty of Versailles actually made absolutely no mention of this aircraft. It's not mentioned by name or by the company's name. Instead, it's the conditions of the armistice signed in November 1918 that require the handover of all examples of this aircraft. I know it's a small thing, but really they are two different agreements and there is a distinction to be made there. Now, only a portion of them were actually handed over. Many of them disappeared in what you might call freak accidents, were burned, or were in fact used by the pilots to simply fly home with their luggage in hand. Others were flown to Switzerland, Denmark or Sweden or was just left in some of the provinces that Germany lost. With Fokker actually taking his own little fleet to his home country, the Netherlands, and they just let him pass. Uh, this is why quite a few of these aircraft survive to this very day. Uh, those that were handed over to the Allies, however, usually rotted away and met a sad end. 
There is a notable exception here, however, and these seem to be the aircraft, about 150 that were sent to the United States, where their steel tubular construction caused quite some interest, and of course the wings themselves as well, and they also ended up in various Hollywood movies. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, consider supporting us on Patreon or via channel memberships to get early access to videos. Now, I of course want to thank the Flugwerft Schleisheim here near Munich for allowing us to get close with their aircraft. Come visit Germany, come visit the museum. It's really one of those places where you can find some iconic birds. Remember to like, share and subscribe, and as always, have a great day. Good hunting and see you in the sky.